this service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church. It is an exciting day. You know how when there's a train coming and you can sort of hear the rumbling, you can sort of feel the rumbling? The Spirit is moving in this place, and that's kind of the way it feels to me. It's, it's here, so let's celebrate here in worship. Um, I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. Of course, first, please sign your friendship pad that's on the end of your pew somewhere so we'll know you're here today. I do want to say a special welcome to anyone who might be a guest or a visitor today. We're glad you're here with us, and uh, we hope you'll come back and visit just as soon and as often as you're able. Uh, we also want to welcome those who are worshiping with us by live stream and we pray that God's Spirit just surrounds and lifts up each one of you this morning. Uh, one of the exciting things about today is that we are going to be ordaining and installing officers. I'm very excited about that as well. You should be. Another really exciting thing is that tomorrow our new communications director starts her service with her. But guess what? She's in worship this morning. Celeste Crow, would you stand up and give a wave? Everybody, this is Celeste. Yay! We're so excited to have her with us, and I know that you will make her feel welcome. I do have a couple of um, a couple of more exciting things to share with you. You will notice in your um, bulletin that there is an insert with the names of the people who are being nominated to our PNC. The nominating committee has worked very hard and has done an amazing job on this committee. And in two weeks from today, this is our official notice, we're having our annual congregational meeting. And at that meeting, several things will take place, one of which is the election of the PNC. The other is, let me make sure I get this all right, we will receive the annual report that will have information about all the committees of the church so that you'll kind of have an idea of what they've been doing all year. We're also going to elect our corporate officers, and we're going to adjust Lauren's terms of call. So I hope that you'll be here for that really important congregational meeting. It's two weeks from today, but that day is one service at 11 o'clock, which if you're here normally at 11 o'clock, that is uh, when you'll be here anyway. So we look forward to that. Um, I also want to let you know that um, next Sunday, one week from today, from today, anyone who is um, a regular attender and you are not yet a member of this congregation, if you'd like to become a member, an official member of our family, we're going to have a new member orientation uh, and reception class. It'll be at 10 o'clock in the session room. So um, if you have not uh, signed on the dotted line, we'll be glad to have you. And uh, if there are any friends or neighbors or uh, folks you know who have been coming, please be sure and pass the word along. All right, friends, one of the things that we celebrate each and every time we gather together is that God is good. And all the time, let us worship God together.
friends, let us now call ourselves to worship using the call to worship in our bulletins. We have been claimed by the God who calls us children. God promises to pass with us through the water and that the rivers shall not overwhelm us. Through God's saving grace, the waters that tested us are now the waters that wash us and nourish us. Come, let us worship the God who washes us in grace. Please be seated. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We who have received the gift of baptism recognize the need to confess our sins and to remind ourselves of our finitude and of God's amazing grace. Therefore, with full confidence in that grace, let us join our voices together, confessing our sins. Let us pray. God of glory, we confess that we have not sought your face. We adore the high and mighty. We adore our things and stuff. We adore the ones who can get us closer to what we want. Forgive us for ignoring your humble servant, Jesus, and for the times we fail to share your love, which you desire for all to receive. Give us grace. Pour out your spirit upon us and renew us in our calling to love and serve you as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ.
and all God's children say together, Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news of the gospel. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so God says to us, you are my beloved and with you I am well pleased. May your hearts be lifted by God's word and know that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. My apologies. That was stunning. Thank you for your gift of music to us today. Let us pray. Holy God, in the River Jordan, you revealed yourself to all who were gathered and pointed to Jesus and said, This is my Son, the Beloved. O oh God, you point to us now 
and you call us your beloved. And so we pray that you will reveal yourself through your word this day, as it is read and it is proclaimed, that we might respond in obedience and receive it with joy as we seek to be your people in the world, a light to all who see us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We turn first to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah lived about 900 years before Jesus, and he talked a lot about the one who would come. We know that now to be Jesus, our understanding of Jesus. Isaiah alludes to it through the word of a servant who will be a light to the nations. Listen to God's word to you today. Isaiah prophesies, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice on the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Fast forward about 900 years after Isaiah, Jesus comes to us through God's power. And after a time of quiet, we don't hear much about Jesus after his birth story. Then we get this story about Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan, and he comes out to make his public, uh, to make himself public for all to be aware. And so, listen to Matthew's gospel as it uh, comes to us from chapter three: the baptism of our Lord Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John, his cousin, at the Jordan River to be baptized by John. John would have prevented Jesus saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered John, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And after Jesus' baptism, I want you to dial it forward to the year 1804. Who likes history? I love history. Meri Weather Lewis and William Clark 
otherwise known as Lewis and Clark, were commissioned by President Thomas Jefferson in the year 1804 to find a passage from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. The expedition was based on the geographical, geographical understanding at that time that from the mighty Mississippi where it spills into the Missouri River that Lewis and Clark's team called the Corps of Discovery would be able to paddle their canoes upstream on the Missouri River whereby they would then walk up a hill, look down a gentle slope that would take the men a half day to cross with their canoes on their backs, and then they would see the Columbia River in the region we now call the Pacific North Northwest, which would then allow them to paddle downstream right into the mouth of the Pacific Ocean. Did it happen that way? No. After 15 months of paddling upstream, which is not an easy task, on the Missouri River, Lewis and Clark and their team were utterly, utterly disappointed that the topography of the land couldn't have been any more different than what they had believed it to be. 300 years of experts had been completely and utterly wrong. Instead of a gentle slope to paddle down to the, myth, paddle down to the Pacific, that's a hard uh, phrase, to paddle down to the Pacific, what was in front of Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery? Do you recall? What was in front of them? The Rocky Mountain Range. The Rocky Mountains, y'all. Who here has seen the Rocky Mountains? I have not, but if you have, you know that they're majestic. The Missouri and the Columbia Rivers don't connect at all. And as far as their eyes could see, instead of a navigable water route, they were standing at the peaks of the Rocky Mountains, stretched out in front of them with canoes and paddles. You see the dilemma. The Corps of Discovery believed that once they left the Mississippi River to paddle the Missouri, that everything that would lie before them would be like what they had already passed through in the eastern part of the United States. When they thought that they'd have to hike a few mountains with their paddles and their canoes. They were thinking more along the lines of what they had already traveled with the Appalachian Mountains, what they had experienced already. And if you know anything about the Rocky Mountains, you know that they're nothing like the Rocky Mountains, our beautiful Appalachians. It became real real quick. In just a matter of moments that Lewis and Clark would not find a Northwest Passage in the way that they had anticipated. And they stood at the foot of mountains with canoes and paddles in hand, in hand unsure of what they were going to do next after they'd been traveling already for 15 months. Presbyterian minister Todd Bolsinger, author of the book Canoeing the Mountains, uses Lewis and Clark's expedition as a metaphor for the church, and I mean church with a big C, church with a capital C, as we stand at the foot of our own metaphorical Rocky Mountain range. Bolsinger writes, in every field, in every business, in every organization, leaders are rapidly coming to the awareness that the world in front of us is radically different from everything behind us. The church, along with every field, business, and organization, finds itself trying to keep up with our rapidly changing world and to keep pace with advances in technology, communication, product development, appetites, and so on. And we find ourselves today as the church with a big C in uncharted territory. 
Jesus knew a thing or two about uncharted territory. So we're not alone, thanks be to God. Up to the point that we encounter Jesus in Matthew's gospel this morning, Jesus has lived a relatively ordinary life, albeit his birth and his family's subsequent exile into Egypt to save his infant life from tyrannical King Herod. That was rather extraordinary. But once they get back to their home, once they make their way back to Nazareth in Galilee, which is in the northern part of Israel, this family lives a fairly ordinary life, just like normal people. Jesus lives a fairly ordinary life as a carpenter's son, in a Jewish family with his brothers and his sisters and his extended family. Up to this moment in Matthew, Jesus was learning the family business. He was studying his scriptures. He was going to temple every week. He was observing the Sabbath with with his family on Friday night. He was celebrating Passover and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Hanukkah like every other faithful Jew in his community. Yet, by and large, Jesus was mostly living in obscurity, doing normal things like normal people, like you and I do every day in our daily lives. As his third decade on the earth dawns, he couldn't just put down his carpentry tools and say, okie dokie, I'm going to get to work and be the savior of the world now. How is that going to work? That might not have been received in the same way. There had to be some visible moment, some tangible experience marking Jesus' transformation and the transition from his ordinary life to this new part of his life, to be the Savior of the world, to let people know that he is the Savior of the world. Baptism by his cousin John in the River Jordan was that moment, that moment when Jesus stepped into uncharted territory. Let's be clear. Jesus' cousin John, who I really like, I think he's cool, the camel-cloaked hippie evangelist of the family, who is down by the river dunking people in the water and proclaiming the forgiveness of sins, hadn't just made up this new ritual to wow the crowds. A similar rite had been used in the Jewish tradition for centuries, a purification ritual whereby people are dipped in water to mark the cleansing of sin prior to their entrance into the holy areas of the temple. It would be as if we had basins out here where we would all dip ourselves before we came in for 11 o'clock worship. How would y'all feel about that? But that's how our Jewish ancestors did it. For those of you who love the story in John's Gospel, the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns all that water into wine, those vases, the six 20-gallon vases, are the waters that have been poured for the purification ritual at the temple. And Jesus miraculously makes them something very different. The radical thing in Matthew's gospel and the radical thing about John the baptizer is that John wasn't a rabbi. And he had taken this ritual of cleansing sins of people in the temple, he'd taken it out of the temple showing people that God is everywhere, not just within the confines of their building, kind of the understanding that God has left the building. And what's interesting about it, and even more remarkable, is that people were following John the baptizer down to the river's edge to have this experience this understanding of cleansing and the forgiveness of sins 
when they offered them for repentance that John was facilitating in the name of God. More uncharted territory. But you might be wondering about, you know, Jesus is sinless. Why does Jesus need to be cleansed of his sin? He's perfect. He's sinless in every way. Well, you're right. Jesus does not need to be cleansed of his sin. So why be baptized? Jesus shows the people from the very beginning moments of his ministry that he stands in solidarity with all humanity. And out of humility and obedience, he will be baptized too. He will be in the flesh God with us. And if that means standing on the riverbed alongside the people of God with mud squishing between their toes and the hem lines of their robes floating all about them, you get it. It's a full sensory experience that's happening. If that's where we want to find Jesus, that's where Jesus will find us. And being baptized was a sign and a symbol of his debut to the world that he knows he's the Savior and he wants us to know it too. It was a new era, the dawn of a new day, the moment when territory that had once been navigable for God's people soon looked and felt very different. This wasn't what they expected. They had a new leader all of a sudden, the beloved one of God filled with the Holy Spirit, sending them back into their community with a new vision and a new mission. Some gathered there on that riverbed that day who were also being baptized probably latched on to Jesus immediately. And they never looked back and they went forward with him into this uncharted territory. But there would have been many others who were also on the riverbanks that day who probably would have said, huh, that dove thing, that voice thing, that was crazy. Did you see that? Never seen anything like that before. And then they may have gone right back to their old life and their old routines as usual. We stand in the crossroads of a particular holy moment today. When we walk out of here, what will life be like for you? At least for the people sitting on our front pews this morning, preparing to be ordained and installed as the officers of our church, I pray that it is not life as usual. But I dare say I hope that they are not forced to face this adventure of discipleship on their own. We will be daily working with you and praying for you as you lead us. Don't get me wrong, ministry, discipleship, mission, growth, these are not easy tasks. They weren't easy for Jesus 2,000 years ago. They're not easy for us today in our community and in our world. And if you hadn't noticed, it's not 1958 anymore, which was the height of church worship attendance and participation in the life of churches in America. 1958. Todd Bolson points out that people are still spiritual, but where spirituality was once considered an extension of one's connection to and participation in their church, Spirituality has become increasingly more individualistic in our society. Bolsinger also notes that many parents today believe that sports participation, involvement in music and theater and dance and the arts is, I quote, more effective at forming good character in their children and thereby getting them into good colleges than the church is. Bolsinger writes, The church is now called on to minister to a passing parade of people who treat us like we are but one option in their personal salad bar of self-fulfillment. 
Ouch. It hurts to think that I have devoted my life to what may be considered by some as a handful of croutons on their personal salad bar of self-fulfillment. Jesus knew nothing of salad bars. He only knew people's hearts and what they needed to be made whole. A relationship with God that he could offer them, he could show them the way. The uncharted territory that Jesus stepped into 2,000 years ago brought new challenges for him personally, for the people to whom he ministered, and it was a message that the establishment resisted. We walk into uncharted territory with, I think, equal the amount of challenges, just different ones. They look different, they smell different, they taste different. We have been baptized into the body of Christ, but many of us wonder, what is this body supposed to look like in this particular day and age in which we live? We ponder, discuss, and debate this at great length around here, the three of us. You're welcome to join us anytime for coffee. We'd love to ponder and wonder and discuss and debate this with you anytime. And on this particular day, when our scripture lessons reference water and the cleansing of sin, we find that we have run into a mountain range. As a church in this new decade, we find ourselves with metaphorical canoes in hand, staring at the Rockies in front of us, wondering, where do we go from here? And at this point, you may think, gosh, can she be any more of a downer? And as I was writing it, this sermon, I got to this point and I asked myself, golly, can you be any more of a downer this morning? So here's the hard truth before we make our upswing. Here's the hard truth we, in this place, need to own right now. And I'm right here with you as I own it, as we own it. No one person is going to be the salvation of the Christian church or our church other than Jesus himself. He's the only one that can save us. We cannot expect that a new senior pastor is going to save us from ourselves and rescue us from the cultural shift that has happened, which seems to have left the church at the bottom of a long list of options from which people can choose today. And that's the reality. But here's the other truth that we can embrace today. The joy, J-O-Y in all caps, of this year will be in the exploration that we do as a congregation that will bring us together and then send us out with new purpose and new focus. We will begin to have intentional dialogue that we haven't had in a long while about ways we can transform our metaphorical paddles into hiking boots, ways we can put down our canoes and pick up our backpacks, ways we can redraw the map to reflect the reality of who we are in this particular time, in this particular place, in this particular community. But here's the thing, friends. You've got to be all in. I'm all in. You've got to be all in to experience the joy of this exploration that is in front of us. You and me, we have to be invested and committed to exploring the uncharted territory that's before us because it's not going to look like what's behind us. And I believe it will be nothing short of exciting, illuminating, exhilarating, enriching. Every now and then it's going to be frustrating. Let's throw that out there. I'm, not a, uh, I'm a realist too. But it's going to be exciting, illuminating, and enriching. 
for us as a body and for each of us as members of it. At the end of this month, this congregation, that's y'all, will elect the Pastor Nominating Committee, also known as the PNC. Get ready for a lot of acronyms. They're going to be rolled out all year long. Who will begin their work of faith formation as a group through deep prayer and focused Bible, Bible study. Everything they do will begin with prayer and the study of God's word. And I couldn't be more envious of them for that journey. Everything they do, everything, will be rooted in prayer and the study of God's word. In February, Cindy will begin holding discussion groups where each and every one of you will have the opportunity to gather with 12 others, or I guess 11 others, 11 others, there will be 12 of you in Good Disciple fact, uh, uh, Organization. There will be 12 of you. You will get to sign up for a time that works for your schedule. It, be, it will be 90 minutes long. Who here has 90 minutes they can spare one day in February? And you get to pick that time. All of us have 90 minutes. You will have the opportunity to share your thoughts and your reflections about what it means to you to be a member and a disciple of First Presbyterian Church. Everyone will have an opportunity to speak. And then your thoughts and reflections will directly assist the pastor nominating committee in doing the important but very meaningful work of calling the person whom God already knows is headed our way. Isn't that the coolest thing? God already knows who that person is. And God's going to reveal it to you and to me in due time. And so there are plenty of other nuts and bolts that will go into this journey that is ahead of us, which will be rolled out gradually in different um, groups and different spurts. Cindy knows the proper words. Um, but unlike Lewis and Clark, we have access, we have at our fingertips so many tools to help us navigate this terrain that is before us. When Jesus stepped out of the River Jordan, newly baptized and filled with the blessing and Spirit of God, he stepped out of the river as one person. Even Lewis and Clark eventually found their way to the Pacific on November 15, 1805, a lot later than they had anticipated, and they had to resource the Native Americans in that area to help them find their way, but they got there. They made their way to the Pacific. And friends, the good news for you and me today as people of faith is that we never step out in uncharted territory alone. As the body of Christ, we step forward into uncharted territory with the blessing and spirit of God, enveloping us from all angles, cushioning our blows, making straight every path, smoothing our rough edges, illuminating the dark places. And no other, in my opinion, no other extracurricular activity or participation or involvement in the salad bar of your life can stake their foundation on such a claim as this, that we, as the Church of Christ, of Jesus Christ, can stake our claim that God will envelop us from all angles, cushion every blow, make straight every path, smooth the rough edges, and illumine the dark places. We can claim this as the Church of Jesus Christ. So grab your boots and your backpacks, friends. You ready? It's going to be a grand adventure. And your prayers and your participation. And let's get ready to scale the peaks that are before us. Territory that we embark upon together in this new decade and in this new season of ministry that is before us. I'm excited, and I hope you are too. Onward and upward we go.
Thanks be to God. Amen. I hope you are inspired, and I hope you know the Spirit is in this place. Friends, let us join together in the litany of gifts, which, which can be found in your bulletin under the ordination and installation of officers. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within our common ministry, women and men are called to particular service as elders, as deacons, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Friends, will you please stand as you are able as we together as a congregation reaffirm our baptismal vows. Ordination calls the whole church to renewed commitment and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule and affirming the faith of the one holy Catholic Church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you have set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you that in baptism you give us your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us into all truth filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you claimed us in our baptism and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us now that we may be empowered to you do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, remember your baptism and be thankful. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to call the following members forward to, the, to gather in the chancel area as they are, uh, with great joy, ordained and installed to the session and the diaconate. Beth Bolin, Dale Bullock, Jeff Planer, Beth Silvers, Karen Simmons, Larry Stiles, and Tim Withrell. These are our elders. 
and Sarah Beth Edwards, Stuart Eulis, Jimmy Green, Kinley Howe, Christy Jen, Jan Jones, Donald Parrott, Nan Thomas, and Barbara Yarbra. Come on down. And now I ask all of you who were prayed for and elected by this congregation the constitutional questions from our Book of Order. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please answer, I will with God's help. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And now for those being ordained and or installed as elders, Beth and Beth, Dale, Jeff, Karen, Larry, and Tim, will you be a faithful elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in the government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If you will, please say, I will with God's help. And now for those being ordained or, and or installed as elders, Sarah Beth Stewart, Jimmy Kinley, Christy, Jan Nan, Donald, and Barbara. Will you be faithful deacons, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If you will, please say, I will with God's help. And now the constitutional questions to the members of the congregation, which again may be found in your bulletin. Do you, members of the First Presbyterian Church, accept these women and men as elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the ways of Jesus Christ? Do you agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who is alone the head of the church? Now I'd like to invite any elders or ministers of the word and sacrament to please come forward as we participate in the laying on of hands. If y'all can kneel on that first step, that would be great. And anybody who needs help getting up afterwards, we're there for you. <laughs> Now, this will take a minute for everybody to get down here.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you, and you have equipped them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you appointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You've called pastors and teachers, bishops and elders and deacons to build up your church by the power of your spirit. In the church, elders, deacons, and pastors serve together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit upon, upon Beth, Sarah Beth, Dale, Stuart, Jeff, Jimmy, Beth, Kinley, Karen, Christy, Larry, Jan, Nan, Tim, Donald, and Barbara, that they may be your faithful elders and deacons in the church. Give them prudence and sound judgment wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governments on the session and diaconate and in every court and council of the church that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Give all these your precious, beloved children joy in their walks of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their ministry. Gracious God, pour out now your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church that we may be for you a holy people baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation in ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, Strengthen our service to the outcasts and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness to the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. This concludes the laying on of hands, and y'all may return to your seats, and y'all may stand up. <laughs> <laughs> if you <laughs> but I'm not finished with you yet <laughs> I love it when the pews empty out for this portion Barbara don't go away we're not done yet <laughs> yeah. Beth Bolin Dale Bullock Jeff Planer, Beth Silvers, Karen Simmons, Larry Stiles, and Tim Witherell, you are now ordained and installed as elders. And Sarah Beth Edwards, Stuart Eulis, Jimmy Green, Kinley Howe, Christy Gentsch, Jan Jones, Donald Parrott, Nan Thomas, and Barbara Yarborough, you are now ordained and installed as deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. And lastly, I charge you with this from 1 Peter. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must, be, must speak as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To God belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And we thank you all for your willingness to serve. You may be seated.
Let us stand and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And in doing so, we give answer to the question, Christians, what do you believe concerning God? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Creator, you formed the heavens and stretched them out. You spread out the earth and made it fruitful. From your glory you came to us in Jesus to dwell with us and to touch the earth with healing and hope. In the strength of the Spirit, we offer you all praise and glory and honor. You invite us, us with our different gifts, our unique personalities, to bring to you our doubts and our fears, our joys and concerns, our petitions and our praise. We open our hearts to you, knowing your spirit prays in us with signs too deep for words. Merciful Father, where people are tired from work or weary with responsibility, where time and resources feel inadequate and tasks seem overwhelming, we pray that you will send your spirit with strength and renewal, where people are in danger and fragile places are under duress, where people are persecuted for who they are and how they live, we pray that you will send your spirit with courage and comfort. Where people have suffered the loss of love or purpose and where love has brought with it a heartbreaking consequence in life, we now ask that you send your spirit to bind up the brokenhearted. Where people are ill and worry for their future, where people suffer pain or disability and long for healing, we pray that you will send your spirit with healing and hope. Where people seek a reliable friend, a true comforter, or a wise advisor, where the lonely long for company to cheer them, please send your spirit of wisdom and compassionship. Where new life is beginning and hope dawns, where there is laughter and joy, healing and positive change, where there is good news to celebrate, we ask that you send your spirit with rejoicing and gratitude. These and all prayers we pray in Jesus' name, gathering our prayers into one voice in the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God has commissioned all of us to spread good news that we are God's beloved children. We're blessed in Jesus' name. Therefore, we now offer our tithes and our offerings to God in thanksgiving 
for that good news. Let us pray. God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, 
we bring our gifts to you with grateful hearts. Bless these gifts that they may help to bring the light of your love into the world and bless our lives too, so that we may be a blessing to those whom we encounter. Through Christ our living Lord that we pray. Amen. A word of gratitude and thanksgiving and congratulations to our officers of you as you have been ordained and installed today thank you for your leadership we look forward to a fun season together in the next few years friends who here likes to hike <laughs> y'all might have to show us the way a little bit this year as we forge new territory we can all learn a little bit from one another as we all invest in this season of new life and new ministry together. And until we meet again, I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that our God will be kind and gracious to you, that the Lord will lift up his favor upon you and give you a peace which surpasses all understanding. Onward and upward, brothers and sisters, let us go in love and service to the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.